Good morning, good afternoon, good night, good uh, life to you, my my friend. Hello. I hope you are well. I hope you are ready for today's episode because we are going to be talking about how anxiety and depression feed each other and how typically if you have high anxiety, you will also have depression or if you have Sometimes if you have depression, you'll also have anxiety. But more often what I find is that if you have unchecked anxiety, you don't know how to manage your anxiety, it just runs your life and then you also have depression. So we're going to talk about why that is and why it may be rooted in trauma. Um, I work with a lot of people who tell me that they have anxiety and depression and what they actually have is trauma that manifests as anxiety and depression. So that is what we're going to talk about today because it's important and if you are taking for example medication for your anxiety but you actually have trauma it's not going to work as well Um, if you're taking medication for your depression but you actually have trauma and your nervous system is just dysregulated then it's not going to work as well. Um, So there has been a lot of really interesting research in the last you know 10-20 years about how trauma gets stored in the body and so we're going to talk about that in this episode we're going to cover that as well and I'm going to treat treat lit I'm going to give you three tips to figure out what's going on and to start managing those cycles so what I find is that once we have awareness of it it usually it helps because then we can say, okay, this is not good. I don't like this. What can we do about it? Um, so I want you to know that you are not powerless. Like just because you experience anxiety right now or because it's unchecked right now doesn't mean that it will be forever. It doesn't mean that this is a death sentence. Like I work with a ton of clients who no longer suffer from anxiety by the time that we finish working together. Now that doesn't mean that they don't have anxious thoughts or feelings. It means they are no longer suffering. Um, but for me, if you no longer have symptoms, then do you have anxiety? Which is a whole separate conversation, how, um, people believe and are told that anxiety is a death sentence and you'll have it for your whole life. And like, that's not necessarily true because technically you're only diagnosed with anxiety if it causes a problem in your life. I mean, we all experience anxious thoughts and feelings. We all are sad. We all struggle to handle unpleasant emotions. Like, that's just normal. Does that mean you have depression or anxiety? Well, if it's not negatively impacting your life, then no. So first things first. Oh, I lost my tea thing. First things first. Anxiety and depression feed each other. And we're going to get into that as soon as I fish this thing out of my tea. Whatever. (laughs) <laughs> so sorry, we're back. Um, I want to tell you about a journal prompt that I made for you. So what it's going to do is it's going to start giving you awareness of these patterns and where your brain is being a gremlin. Now, gremlin brain is when our brain is like trying to help us, but it's not doing a very good job. And it's kind of like when you're a toddler if you've ever been around a toddler who's like, I want to help. And they just like muck everything up. Like that's essentially your gremlin brain. Your brain is like, I want you to be safe. So I'm going to ruin everything. Like, oh, that's not super helpful. So I call that gremlin brain. So what the journal prompt does is it helps you bring gremlin brain to life so we can examine it without judging it. It's just trying to help and start rewiring your brain to be more aligned with what you actually want. So it's going to take you through that process. It's going to help you figure out what the next step is. We don't necessarily need to know every step. We just need the next step. So it's going to help you figure that out. And the more that we practice awareness and problem solving, the better our life gets because everything is problem solvable. So this journal prompt will help you do it. It, I call it the self-coaching journal. You can call it whatever you like, I guess. This is your dream. (laughs) But you can get it at livemyhappyhealth.com slash self journal. That you download it. It's free. Love it. Eat it. Burn it. I mean, don't burn your computer. But um, print it out. Burn it. Whatever you want to do with it. It's your dream. So back to anxiety and depression, how they feed each other. So what happens when I have clients who come and they say, I have anxiety and I have depression. And I'm like, yeah, 
I'm not going to tell them what they do and don't have. They may or may not meet the criteria. But typically people know what they're struggling with, right? So I'm actually a big believer in self-diagnosing. Not so much, no, medical conditions too, because nobody knows your body like you know your body. Now this can, this exists on a spectrum like everything else. So if you're like, I have every disorder in the world. No, you don't. No, you don't. That's not real. If like you're, you stub your toe and you're like, oh my God, it's brain cancer. No, no. No, that's <laughs> that's not a thing, right? But I actually find that a lot of my clients are dead on when they are self-diagnosing because nobody knows themselves better than them. Nobody knows you better than you. Nobody knows what you experience better than you. And what I tell them and what I will tell you is experience matters when you're diagnosing, right? So like run any diagnosis that you feel fit you by a professional that you trust. Don't ask someone who you don't trust or who you just met because they don't know you. But what really happens when we diagnose is that I just ask you if you fit the criteria and then I educate based on my experience and what I've seen. Which is why you want to ask someone who has experience, who has an education, and that you trust. And by trust, I mean who knows you. And that you trust, right? You want to value their opinion. So a lot of people come to me and they say, I have anxiety and I have depression. I'm like, yeah, super legit. Okay, you know better than me because I just met you. And what I come to find out through the course of working with them is what they actually have is trauma. So there's some things you need to understand about trauma in order to understand how anxiety and depression are a cycle. Trauma dysregulates your nervous system from homeostasis so what I mean by that is when you go through a traumatic situation it is so abnormal to your nervous system that it fundamentally changes the way that your nervous system is wired and how it functions so it either pumps it way up hypervigilance anxiety always on edge really irritable everything makes you explode or it turns it way down there are only ever two functions it goes up or it goes down fight or flight right you fight and interestingly enough anxiety is also a flight response you run away from everything you avoid your feelings you avoid anything that's scary you avoid anything that puts pressure on you you avoid everything taking care of yourself admitting that you're struggling whatever you avoid it or it shuts you way down so this is fawning or freezing now there's actually four responses when we are um, scared. There are four fear responses. So I'm going to explain those now. There's fight or flight, pretty self-explanatory. You fight or you run away. (laughs) There is fawning, which means you give in, you placate. Placate? Placate? However you pronounce that word. Um, If you've ever watched a woman who's uncomfortable with a man, this is that. So you say yes when you want to say no. You people please, essentially. You laugh off a joke that makes you really uncomfortable. Um, you just give in. You become who they want you to be because that's the safest option in the moment. You fawn or you freeze. So you just, you become paralyzed. You procrastinate, right? That is a freeze response. So your nervous system only does one of those four things to pump you up, fight or flight, to turn you down, freeze or fawn. So what happens if you get turned up is you are constantly, your body thinks you're constantly running from a bear. So this is how they feed each other, right? So if your response was to be pumped up, your body's like, oh my God, we're running away 24 seven. We are literally running from a bear 24 seven. Now you can only run from a bear for so long before your body's like, oh my God, I can't keep running anymore. I'm going to die. So what does it do? It shuts your nervous system down. It shuts you down. It forces you to stay in bed for three days. It makes you so numb because you were running for wide open at way too long. Your body is smarter than you. It has an off switch. That off switch looks a hell of a lot like depression. So if you're so burned out, if you're so overwhelmed, if you've been at wide open for so long, your body's like, oh, cool. If we keep doing this, we're going to die. So I'm going to shut you down and force you to rest and force you to be numb and force nothing makes you happy, right? So it happens when we're in survival mode all the time. 
So your body's going to shut you down. Now, this is a problem, obviously, because you have a life to live and, um, you know, yeah, <laughs> you have to live your life. So it's pretty inconvenient to either be so up here that you're literally running 24-7 full speed or so down here that you like literally can't get out of bed or you want to die, right? So what will also happen is because you're so stressed out, you're so overwhelmed, you're so in danger because your body thinks you are in danger, your nervous system thinks you are in danger because it's dysregulated, that you'll just want to die. And your body's like, well, shit, if I can never get out of danger, I may as well be dead. Well, well, I can see how we get to that logic. Now, I'm not recommending suicide. Obviously, if that's something you're experiencing, please talk to a professional. They can help you. But I see how our brain gets there if we're always in danger and we never get peace. Because, you know, dead people have eternal peace. So again, not recommending suicide, but I understand the logic. So what happens is if we're up here all the time, we're running from a bear all the time because anything that's dangerous, your nervous system is wired to think is quite literally a physical threat. Like our our bodies and our brain and our nervous system are not wired to understand like a threat that comes from social media. Like if you think about human history and evolution, we existed in pretty small communities. So we're talking like you know, max a few hundred people, you were maybe fighting with like a neighboring tribe, but pretty much your life was pretty good if you weren't being chased by a bear. So your nervous system was wired to say, oh, if there's danger, I'm literally in immediate physical danger, need to get away, need to do one of the four responses. So if that's what's happening, your body can't differentiate like, oh, this stress is because of finances. This stress is because I hate my job. This stress is because of my partner or my family or existing under capitalism. Your brain and your body just think that you're running from a bear 24-7, which obviously, as we now know, is a huge problemo. Or problema. So... When you are wide open, when your nervous system gets tuned to anxiety, to hypervigilance, to overreacting, it looks like overreacting only because you're not literally running from a bear. If you're running from a bear, it would be appropriately reacting, but there is no bear, so it's overreacting. Your body will shut you down by then going to depression. Now, here's where the other side comes in, right? So you understand that if you're super, super wide open, your body has an off switch because you will literally die, and so your body's like, we're going to shut you down for a number of days. Thank you, body. You are very intelligent. What happens when we go the fawn or freeze route is that is also abnormal. Humans are meant to respond to very, very, very acute short-term stressors. We are not wired. Nothing that is alive is wired to thrive with long-term chronic stress. Trauma is long-term chronic stress because your system is carrying it. Living under capitalism, long-term chronic stress, being in a marginalized community, long-term chronic stress, poverty, long-term chronic stress, childhood abuse, long-term chronic stress. You understand what I'm saying, right? So if any of these exist for you, you likely have symptoms of trauma that are manifesting as anxiety and depression, and they are likely cycling. The depression one is a little trickier, and that's why I'm going to explain it. So think about if something is hunting you and you are hiding, you're very, very still, you are turned down, your nervous system is turned down, right? Because you are freezing, but that is still a fear response. So what happens is if your system reacts by shutting you down, you're st- it still thinks you're being hunted. So now you're not being chased by a bear, you're being hunted by a bear, which is slightly different. So you're not running all the time. You're constantly terrified to move. You're constantly on edge. You're constantly, because this will create anxiety as well, you're hypervigilant, but you can't move. You are trying to problem solve a thousand miles a minute, but you can't move, right? You are chronically self-sacrificing or self-abandoning by playing dead, by fawning, by trying to be nice so the bear doesn't eat you. But still, that is stressful to your system. Humans are meant to exist as we are 
in relative safety, right? Safety is always relative, but with long-term peace and safety is how we're meant to thrive. It's how anything that is alive is meant to thrive. If you stress something out for long enough, it'll just die. Humans are extremely adaptable, which is a curse and also a blessing sometimes. Well, it's a blessing and also a curse sometimes. <laughs> I said it a little backwards, but you know what I mean. So if, you, if your nervous system shut down, it thinks you're being stalked. It thinks you're being hunted, which creates anxiety. So now, again, you're running wide open. You're just not literally running. Your brain is running wide open instead of your body running wide open. And so your body has to shut it down. And so then we become more depressed. And so what happens is people think that they have anxiety and depression. And while they may fit the symptoms, what we need to work on is the root. If the root is trauma, and I, in most cases it is, then we have to treat the trauma. We can't just treat the depression and say, well, you need better self-care or you need more self-discipline, which if you have a chronic mental health issue, yeah, you need more self-discipline, hands down. Yes, you need more self-care, hands down. Um, you need to learn how to challenge your anxious thoughts. Like, yes, all of those things are helpful, but they are not digging the rot out. They are not turning the shit that you have gone through into fertilizer. Those are flowers. Those are what we're replanting. But first, we have to clean out your soil. We have to literally clean out your system. Now, I mentioned in the beginning of this episode that trauma actually gets stored in the body. So what I mean by that is what I explained a little bit earlier. It fundamentally changes your nervous system because if you never have the opportunity to place the event in a timeline, so what happens is trauma also exists out of time, which is why if you feel triggered, it will feel like you are back at that moment. If you experienced um, childhood abuse, right? So let's say that you lived in a house with a garage door. And every time your parents would come home, they would open the garage door and they would come in and they would beat the living hell out of you. You are going to be triggered by garage doors. But you may not really understand it until later. So let's say that you go, you move out, you live in an apartment, doesn't have a garage door. You get a house with a carport, doesn't have a garage door. But one day you buy a house with a garage And you don't think anything of the garage door because it wasn't a direct trigger, right? Obviously, you would be afraid of your parents, but like garage doors, who would think of that? And you open the garage door and it sounds just like the garage door when you were a kid. You are going to be triggered. You're going to be triggered. Maybe, right? Not all triggers connect, but for the purposes of this explanation, let's say this one does. And it will feel like you are back in that moment. Because trauma exists out of time. So what we have to do in order to heal this cycle of anxiety and depression is we have to treat the trauma. We have to treat the root. Sometimes it's trauma. Sometimes it's not. But in this case, we're assuming it is. So we have to treat the trauma in order for us to reintegrate that traumatic event into our timeline, into our memory. So that way our nervous system and our brain knows, okay, this was then. That was then and this is now. Now, if the root is anxiety, you grew up in a super anxious family, you, um, that was just how your family was. That was how your caretakers were. You didn't really have any safety as a child, but you weren't necessarily abused. Then yeah, you are gonna grow up and have lots of anxious behaviors. Why? Your life was not safe. So that makes perfect sense. So in that case, we have to treat the anxiety. But the same thing still applies. If you're too wide open all the time because you always have to problem solve, you always have to be on the lookout, you you always have to plan for the worst case scenario because you did when you were younger or you did in that scenario, then it's too much for too long. It's too overwhelming. Your body's going to shut you down. It's literally, it's just going to happen. So we still end up with the same cycle of anxiety and depression and without really understanding why. And then people get into, and this is why we're talking about this today, People get into thinking that it's a death sentence and you can never get rid of it. And oh my God, medication helps a little bit, but it doesn't really help. And now listen, if you need medication, more power to you. It can be very helpful. But if we're treating the wrong root, it is not helpful, which is why we're talking about this. Or if you grew up and something happened and you're, you're just 
sad. You're sad and you're depressed and you can't get it right or there's something going on or like chronic um, medical conditions can cause depression. So that's something. So it's not like every, it's not like it's a death sentence, right? And we'll come back to the point of this episode, which is that they cycle and they feed each other. So we need to treat the root. So if you are in that space, if you're like, oh my God, I have anxiety and depression. Well, thank God you're listening to this episode because I hope it was helpful. Talk to a professional, right? This is something that you quite literally need to talk to a therapist about and ideally a therapist who is trained in trauma. And you may say, well, Amanda, aren't all therapists trained in trauma? Kind of, kind of. Find a therapist who has lots of training in trauma and understands how it impacts the central nervous system. Find someone who understands how systems impact trauma, right? If you are going to a therapist and they don't understand that poverty is traumatic, that is not a good therapist. If they're like, oh, race has no basis on trauma, don't go see them. Like that is ridiculous. No, right? We need to look at systemic impacts as well. So now we understand that anxiety and trauma can cycle. If you're too wide open for too long, your body will shut you down because your body is smart and is trying to protect you. If you are too down for too long, it is also terrifying, which means you're going to have lots of anxiety about it. So how do we even deal with it? If you're like, oh, Amanda, I'm in this episode and I don't like it. That sounds like me. Well, friend, I'm sorry. Because I know that that's hard. Like I know that that is so hard and it is exhausting and it is very scary and there are ways that we can manage it. So how do we manage it? Glad you asked. I'm going to tell you. The first thing that we do is we just have to be aware of which cycle we are in. We we are in. We have to be aware of our cycle. So if you are currently in an anxiety cycle, you're going to know because you're going to feel hypervigilant. You're going to be questioning everything. You're going to be overthinking everything. You may be tired, but it's different than like, I can't get out of bed for three days or I can't function or I'm so empty, right? You are empty because your feelings are too overwhelming and your body is smarter than you. So it shut you down. So are we in shutdown mode or are we in running from a bear mode? Those are your two modes. Which one are we in? If you are in anxiety mode, our goal is to address the anxiety behavior. So we want to challenge thoughts. We want to be realistic about our worst case scenario. We want to detach from anxiety spirals. I call those the hell holes of suck. We want to detach from those thoughts. So if we think, oh my God, what if this goes wrong? And then you think a million other things are going to go wrong. Detach from that. Count grains of sand if you have to. Look up facts about animals. I don't care. Just detach from that cycle. If you are in a depression cycle, you need to rest. Like you're in it because you're exhausted. And again, your body is smarter than you. So it is trying to help you out. So you need to rest. If you're in a depression cycle, we need to rest. And we need probably more self-care. And then we also want to do the anxiety behavior managing. It's just not the first thing that we do. So it depends on which cycle you're in. If you're in the anxiety cycle, obviously address the anxiety behaviors, then the depression behaviors. If you're in the depression behaviors, address the depression stuff, then the anxiety stuff. So anxiety stuff looks like challenging doomsday thoughts and the things your gremlin brain tells you that are not helpful, like everyone hates you and it's all going to go wrong and nothing works out for me. Like, that's not true. Okay. Go listen to my episode on thought challenging. It will help you. I think it was like two before this maybe. It's definitely out, so go listen to that one. It'll be helpful. We want to recognize that, oh, hey, I'm probably feeling like I'm running from a bear right now and I'm not literally in danger. So you can do things like affirmations. You can repeat to yourself like, I'm safe. I'm okay. I can figure it out. I'm not in danger. I'm stable. I can handle this. Those things are really good for that too. We want to rest. You're going to need to rest, otherwise your body's going to shut you down. So work on anxiety behaviors. If we're in the depressive cycle, we need things like self-care. You probably need to sleep. Are you exhausted? You're probably exhausted. Being an adult is exhausting in itself. Being an adult in an anxiety depression spiral, oh, so much more exhausting. Go to sleep. Rest more, right? Oh, but I rest all the time. I know. It's because you're exhausted. Rest more. Work on self-care. If you, 
um, need to eat healthy foods, which you do, eat healthy foods. Get outside. Drink your water. Don't just exist on coffee and Red Bull. That's a problem. <laughs> like, drink water. It's going to help you. So we want to address those first and then address the other ones after. Now, this is a process. It's going to take time. You are literally learning and implementing new skills. That takes time. But I believe in you and you can do it. If the root is trauma, you need to treat the trauma. And I am telling you, you need a professional to do it. Do not do it by yourself. You're only going to get as far as you know and you don't know how to do it because you don't do it for a living, right? I could try and build a house by myself and it would be a real shitty house because I don't know how to build a house. So I would obviously hire a contractor. Now, if you cannot afford mental health services, there are many, many clinicians who do a sliding scale. So just ask them, say, hey, do you offer a sliding scale? Hopefully the answer is yes. Keep going until you find a yes. You can even look them up if they offer a sliding scale. You can buy workbooks. There are lots of workbooks that will help you. But ideally, in the long run, we're looking for someone to help us through it. But you can start with workbooks. There are a lot. If you just look up PTSD recovery or PTSD workbook on Amazon, there are a lot of them. And that is how we do it, friends. So we have to figure out which cycle we're in. Are you in running from a bear or are you in hiding from a bear? Right? Are you wide open anxiety mode or are you shut down depression mode that matters because we have to know which one are we dealing with first we'll deal with the other one after first things first right there's a reason that they there's a reason that they say that and you want to honor the cycles like this is your reality right now it doesn't mean that it's your reality forever but currently it is your reality so we need to just be honest about what cycle we're in and deal with it when we need to. So if you are in a depression phase, rest. Acknowledge it. Don't lie and be like, I'm not in that. Yes, you are. Yes, you are, friend. Just deal with it and it's okay. Hmm. Okay. That is that one. If you need further support with that, again, there's workbooks on Amazon. There are lots of journals that'll deal with anxiety. There are many, many ways, but Ideally, you are finding a professional who you trust to help you work through this. And if your root is trauma, please find a trauma-informed therapist. Very important that they have trauma-informed in their thing. And you can ask them, right? Like you are well within your rights to ask them, hey, do you work with people who have trauma? That is a really good question to ask. I would encourage you to ask them that. So... Be good. Good luck. Honor your stuff. For the anxiety behaviors, if you look through some of my past episodes, you'll definitely find some things that are going to be helpful for you. Definitely the thought challenging episode. Um, Yeah. If you're on the YouTubes, tell me your thoughts. Like, put them in the comments. If you're on the podcast, shoot me a message on Instagram at Amanda underscore chills. Tell me your comments. Tell me what you think. Was this surprising? Are you like, holy cheese whiz? Which cheese whiz? I don't eat cheese whiz. I don't know if you guys do, but it weirds me out. Anyway, holy cheese whiz. This is me. I never thought about this before. Okay, oh my God, let me know so that I can do more episodes on it. Okay, y'all go be good. Take care of yourselves.